Amen. Thank you, Gerald. As, as you are being seated, let me invite you, if you have a Bible, to go ahead and open it up to the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians is where we'll be this morning. You can uh, go to the New Testament. There you'll find the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Go beyond them, Acts and Romans. And you'll see the two Corinthians, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And uh, then you'll find the book of Galatians. If you're a guest here this morning, you, or if you don't come very often to Hickory Grove, if you're going to notice... Uh, there is some difference in, in the way and the reason behind we do things, especially around the sermon. The sermon almost every Sunday morning will be based completely, it'll feel like a Bible study. Because we'll read the Bible and uh, then we end up talking just about the Bible. So that the sermon is not something creative that I've come up with. The sermon is actually us just looking at God's Word because we believe that that the Bible, as God's Word, has authority over our lives. So that's why today uh, you'll see us talking a lot about the Bible. A couple of things I want you to be aware of, really just two of them. Uh, tonight we will have a Christmas night of worship at our Harris campus. That's at 5 o'clock. Hope that you'll be there. It will be a great night. Uh, not, it's not a program. It's not a show. It actually will be a participatory time of Christmas worship, so I hope you'll be able to make that. And then as you look forward to next week, we have, of course, Sunday morning uh, services. And then the next day is Christmas Eve, and we'll have services here on Christmas Eve at 5 o'clock um, here and 4.15 at Harris, so kind of close. But anyway, I hope you'll be able to be here for Christmas Eve. All right, enough talk about that. Let's go to the Bible. If you found Galatians 4, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's Word. Galatians chapter 4, I'll read just a few verses. I'll start in verse 4 and uh, read down to about verse 7. And we'll spend most of our time just looking at two verses, verses 4 and 5. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin reading in verse 4. <clears throat> but when the fullness of time had come... God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. Join me as we pray. Father, thank You for the joy of singing unto the Lord Thank you for the joy of seeing people baptized as a symbol of new life and resurrection, a new life we have in Christ. Lord, I pray that today would be an encouragement for the Christian men and women that feel like they're just barely hanging on. I pray for the men and women here that are not sure where they stand before you. Don't really even think about God very much. I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you might awaken their hearts to believe and rejoice. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The passage before us this morning in Galatians chapter 4 is more powerful than it appears at first glance. It resonates with joy, it pulsates with depth. But to see that, you've got to slow down just a little bit. You have to slow down and think about the latent truths that you'll find in this passage. During the month of December, we're now in our third Sunday of celebrating Advent. The word Advent is a Latin word that means the coming. It's where we get the Greek word parousia, which means second coming. It is merely a month of you and I thinking about the coming of Jesus Christ. But not just thinking about the coming of Jesus Christ, we must think beyond that. What is the impact of that? What is the meaning for the coming of Jesus for all of those sitting in here who actually are children of God? 
You, you may have noticed I sort of pulled a passage up out of a context we haven't been in. Uh, when we study the Bible, we want to study it in context. Well, this passage, it's in the context of, of Paul making an argument. And his argument is to show us how profound the coming of Jesus Christ, how it actually, how does Jesus coming actually make men and women into sons and daughters of God? How does that happen? When you read it, it's in clipped and straightforward prose. And in clipped and straightforward prose, Paul is telling us how we go from being slaves. That's the language he uses. From being slaves to sin and becoming actual, legal, genuinely adopted children of God. Well, to think about that, you've got to think about the whole book. Back in chapter 3 of Galatians, in chapter 3, Paul tells us that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. What does that mean? The curse of the law is this. We see the law of God. We can't keep it, the Ten Commandments. We, we can't be righteous. And so because of that, we understand we deserve punishment. And Jesus then became the curse for us on the cross, right? He, he took the punishment from God for sinners. That's what Paul's talking about. And chapter 4 tells us how what happened at the cross. So why is that important? What happened at the cross, how it saves us, and how then we are adopted as sons and daughters of God. And so on this third Sunday of Advent, I want you and I to be able to rejoice in the coming of King Jesus. I want this passage to, con to convince you, those of you that are Christians, I want to convince you that you should trust Him more, that you should worship Him more, that you should love Him even more than you already do right now. And, and for those of you sitting here today that are not Christians or you're not believers or you're just not actually sure where you fit, you might believe in God, you're not sure how that works. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to read the Bible. Just, you just read what I have here on the page and what will be on the screen. I want you to read the Bible. Maybe you haven't prayed in a long time, but I'm going to ask you to ask, say this prayer as you're reading. Just say it silently. Ask God to give you eyes to see and ears to hear His Word as we focus our attention on the coming of Jesus. See, Advent. At Advent, in Christ, God sets the slaves free. Hear the language. In Christ, God sets the slaves free. You don't have to Look very far into our history. Just look over your shoulder a little bit a couple hundred years back. And there you'll find in our own American history the word slavery. I want you to bring the drama there back there in the 1800s. Bring it forward as you think about this passage. And the drama, that's the drama behind the doctrine of salvation. It's God working in grace to save all of His people. Let's see if I can explain it. I'll try to give you three or four points. Here's the first one, number one. At Advent, at Advent, we celebrate God's intervention, God intervening. You might use the phrase divine intervention. Well, at Advent, this is what we're celebrating, God breaking into our world. Let me show it to you. Go with me there in verse 4. Now, I'm going to read something to you. You may have already picked it up. I'm going to point something out that I've done before in other passages, but it's important for you to see it. And it's right there in verse 4. In verse 4, there is... A, a little two-word phrase embedded in this sentence that actually sums up the entire gospel. Some of you already have seen it. Let me read verse 4. Verse 4. But, I put a comma there, but when the fullness of time had come, comma, God sent forth His Son. Now, here's what I want you to do. Keep looking at the page there, you, at, the, at the Bible on the screen. And, and see there in verse 4, I want you to put a parenthesis around the phrase, 
in the fullness of time. Put a parenthesis around it, lift it up out of there, put it on the shelf just for a moment. Just, we'll, we'll go back and get it. And now when you take that out, what you see remaining are the two words, but God. I want you to see that but God, that little phrase is the gospel. Why is it the gospel? Because back in verse 3, Paul says that we are enslaved. By, by law, the law tells us, the law of God tells us we're sinners and we'll never be good enough. We are enslaved by law and by sin. How does that work? We are accused by the law and we're shackled by our sin. Bring the drama of slavery. We are accused by the law. We're shackled by our sin. We are, we are whipped by our conscience. We are abused by our guilt. We are slaves. And at Advent, what is Advent telling us? Advent is the phrase, but God. You see, there is this, this divine emancipation proclamation that tells us you no longer are a slave to that. You are now a son or a daughter. The problem we run into is that many of you sitting in this congregation this morning, too many of you sitting here in church are staying in the slavery of sin. And, and the phrase, but God, tells you that you can forevermore be free. This little phrase, but God, reminds us that the coming of Christ is the turning point of history. In fact, apart from these two words, but God, apart from those two words, life offers us no future. There's no hope. There's no freedom. Look, if your soul, if your soul isn't unshackled by the phrase, but God, then you remain a slave to sin. Maybe you're not a slave. Maybe you wouldn't see yourself as a slave to sin. You're a slave maybe to fashion or, or, or maybe you're a slave to money or you're a slave to sex or secretly you're a slave to pornography or maybe you're a slave to popularity or you're a slave to drugs or you're a slave to alcohol or, or maybe yours is more respectable. You're a slave to success or you're a slave to work. Or maybe yours is still more respectable than that. You're a slave. Look, if your soul is not awakened, if your soul is not awakened by the phrase, but God, you remain a slave to your own respectability. You remain a slave to your own responsibility. Maybe yours is so respectable that you're a slave to making sure that your kids are successful. And if that's true about you, then look, you're nothing more than a slave with a good haircut. You're still shackled, still not free. And this passage is telling us at Advent, what has God done? God has intervened in Christ. That's Advent. Now, with that on the table as the first point, let's talk about how. How did God intervene in Christ. Well, that takes me to the second point. Here's the second point, number two. At Advent, at Advent, we marvel at God's timing. God's timing. One of the things we believe at Hickory Grove is that our God, the God of the Bible, uh, is in control of all things and He works through time working out His perfect and complete plan and I want to believe that more and more. I, I preach that. I want it to be part of who I am. But I'll tell you the truth. Last Sunday, uh, when that weather came through, it was the worst timing possible. If you're a preacher, you, why can't it snow and rain on Tuesday? I mean, not to mention at Hickory Grove, I mean, we always operate just right at the budget. We always operate and... And uh, if Sunday comes along and people don't show up, guess what they don't bring with them? They're not sending their money in. They feel like they got a free Sunday, a Sunday off. Two for one deal. <laughs> and look, I'm, I'm telling you, you, get, you think about those things, all of it goes into, and then I go and study for this message and I'm reminding of, reminded of the, the timing. And at Advent, what do we do? We marvel at God's timing. 
I'm going to show you where I get that. Okay, remember the phrase I said put on the shelf? Pull it off now in verse 4. Put it back in the page. And let me read it. Go with me to verse 4. Notice what the text says. But when the fullness of time had come, fullness of time, that phrase, the exact right time. The exact right time for what? Well, I keep reading verse 4. When the fullness of time had come, this is what God did. God sent forth His Son, born of a woman. Now you see what he's talking about here. Paul is taking us back to the birth of Jesus, the actual historical birth of Jesus, and says that was the exact right time for Jesus to come. Now, then the next question's got to be, if you're studying the Bible, this is what you ask. Well, why was that the exact right time? You've got to travel back with me 2,000 years, 2,018 or 2,015 years. Not exactly sure the exact year Jesus was born, but over 2,000 years ago. Why was that the perfect time? Well, I've been studying this all week. I've read a whole bunch of commentators and theologians. And uh, they all kind of start saying the same thing. I'm saying that to say... If I were going to quote someone, I'm not exactly sure how to quote because they're all saying they are actually stealing from one another. So I don't know who actually came up with it the first time, but but they come up with about four categories, four ways it was the right time. I'll break them down like this. Here's the first one: When Jesus came, it was the right time theologically. Right time theologically. Here's what I mean. Everything that was written about Jesus in the Old Testament was leading up to this very point, to the coming of the Messiah. The whole Old Testament is pointing in that direction. The first promise of the gospel of redemption is in Genesis chapter 3, when man fell into sin. And there, as God gives the curse of sin and he curses the serpent, embedded in the curse of the serpent is the promise of the gospel. God made the covenant with Abraham and told him he would be a blessing and nations would come from him. When God gave the law of Moses and the law of Moses from Exodus forward has done its work. You read the Old Testament, there are over 300 prophecies of Jesus just in the Old Testament. When Paul writes his prologue to, uh, to, to the church in Ephesus, in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 1, Paul tells us that the coming of Jesus was the plan of God before the foundation of the world. It was the right time theologically. <clears throat> but not just theologically. When Jesus came, it was the right time religiously. Think about the world that Jesus came into. Think about Rome and Judaism. When Jesus came into the world, the paganism of Rome was completely bankrupt. It was completely empty. The worship of the emperor was hypocritical. Jesus came into the world. The Judaism of the day was, was without leadership. They were looking, longing for a Messiah. On top of that, Paul writes in the book of Romans that all of creation was groaning. So when Jesus was born, it was the right time theologically. It was the right time religiously. It was the right time. Let me give you a third one. It was the right time culturally, culturally. Think about history now. Look back to there in history. When Jesus was born in the world he was born into, the Greek language was almost universally known. It was not the native language of Jews but it became the lingua franca. It became the, the language that people used in commerce. In fact, it was so popular that the New, Te the New Testament was first written down in Greek. And the Greek language was so widespread that after the resurrection of Jesus, the gospel was easily shared because so many people knew Greek. I'll give you a fourth category. It was the right time politically. Tell you what, it's much easier to talk about politics 2,000 years ago than it is now. So let's talk about it then and not now. Politically. Where, what was going on politically? The all-powerful Rome had conquered and subdued all of the surrounding nations. 
something known as the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome, made it so that the infrastructure was built, there were roads going everywhere. After the resurrection, when it came time to share the gospel, it was easy to push it all to all of the corners of the, of the known world. So when Jesus was born, it was the right time theologically, it was the right time religiously, it was the right time culturally, it was the right time politically. You take all of that into consideration, and you know what this does? This reminds us once again, this is the God we believe in. This reminds us once again that our all-controlling God, He works through time, and He does it perfectly to accomplish His saving purpose. Why does that mean anything to you? I'll tell you why. It means you can trust Him in your adversity. It means you can pray to Him in your calamity. It means you can worship Him in His all-wise movement in time. In fact, it means that the timing of your presence sitting here at church today, hearing this message, was planned out perfectly. Why? To bring you to the cross of Jesus so that you could see God's intervention, so that you could marvel at God's timing. Let me give you a third thing we do. Third thing we do at Advent. Number three. At Advent, we center on God's Son. This is, this, is, this is important for those of us that are Christians. Let us not forget that Christmas is not primarily about seeing family and travel and gifts. All of those things are good and right. But Christmas is a reminder for us to, we have a very narrow view of Christmas that puts all of our weight and attention on Jesus. Go, go with me again to verse 4. Let me prove it to you. I want you to, I'm going to read verse 4 and let's, uh, let's break it up into little pieces and then maybe just talk about it. By the way, verse 4 and 5, if you're not familiar with Christian doctrine, verse 4 and 5 are really great verses. It's amazing to me um, how much important Christian doctrine Christian teaching about Jesus is revealed in verse 4 and also in verse 5. So let's take verse 4. Let me read it. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Let's look at at least three things about Jesus. First, I want you to see the full divinity of Christ. Fully divine. We believe not that Jesus was a great man, but that He was the God-man. you notice in verse 4 that the text says, Paul writes that God, God sent forth His Son. Paul is writing it like that, showing us that Jesus is the pre-existent, fully divine, in, infinite Son of God. In fact, in fact, Paul writes a hymn about Jesus, a hymn, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15, 16, and 17. In that hymn, Paul says it like this about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and in Jesus all things hold together. Why is that important? That reminds us that He alone, Jesus alone, is the infinite Son of God. And because of that, He alone is the one that can bear the infinite wrath of God. It, this is why it's important for Jesus to be fully divine, because He alone, only Jesus, can bear the infinite wrath of God on the cross. Fully divine. But I also want you to see not just the full divinity of Christ, notice the full humanity of Christ. You'll see in verse 4, the full humanity of Christ. Notice what the text says. God, 
sent forth his son. Notice how he did it. Born of a woman. There is Christmas right there. Born of a woman. Why is that important to us? We think about Mary. You can read the Magnificat. You can uh, sing the song that Mary sang. It's a beautiful song. A soul magnifies the Lord. You can do all of that. But let's not forget that there was a very natural process. That Mary was pregnant nine months. She went through all of the things that every pregnant woman goes through. After nine months of pregnancy, it was followed by a very normal birth. If Mary had had Facebook, she would have put pictures Seven minutes after the baby comes, Lord Almighty, you people, I'll tell you. I've said it before, you need to let that baby cure a little bit before you put all the pictures up. <laughs> she went through a normal, a, born of a woman, a normal process, nine months of pregnancy, followed by a normal birth of a fully human son. The writer of Hebrews, ever read the book of Hebrews that points to the exaltation of Jesus? Jesus is greater than all things. And, and the writer of Hebrews tells us something about the humanity of Jesus. He says that it was important for Jesus to be fully human. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. The writer says, we, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted and yet without sin. You know what Paul tells us in Romans? Paul tells us in Romans that sin came into the world through one man, Adam. Brought sin into the world that has affected all of us and salvation came into the world through one man, Jesus. Fully divine, fully human. Normally, that's the coin. You have fully divine on one side, fully human on the other. You flip it back and forth and it gives you uh, sort of the description of Jesus. I'd, act, I'd like to add another side to that. I think the text, the Bible says this. You see, the full divinity of Jesus, the full humanity of Jesus, I want you to see the full righteousness of Christ. Let me show you where I get that. It's in verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son... God sent forth His Son, so that's the full divinity, born of a woman, that's the full humanity. Now here's the full righteousness, born under the law. Why is that important? Well, if we believe that Jesus is fully divine, we certainly already believe in His full righteousness, that He came into this world fully righteous without sin. That internally, as being fully divine, He's completely righteous, but we needed him to be righteous externally. Here's what I mean by that. Jesus wasn't just born a man. He was born a Jewish man. And as a Jewish man, Jesus went to the synagogue. There he learned, read, recited, and then fulfilled all of the laws of God in a way that you and I cannot do. Jesus lived as the one perfect righteous man. This is important because had he not been righteous, he could not redeem unrighteous men and women like me and you. Okay, so take all of what we just said, the last three things. The full divinity of Jesus, the full humanity of Jesus, the full righteousness of Jesus. You put it all together. You know what that means? That means that only Jesus is the uniquely and fully qualified person to be our Redeemer. Redeemer. In fact, that's where all this has been heading. Redemption. You see, at Advent, we celebrate God's intervention. At Advent, we marvel at God's timing. At Advent, we center on God's Son. But this fourth point is really kind of the punch of the whole thing. At Advent, at Advent, we see the fulfillment of God's plan. 
You have to see it in verse 5. And to get the punch of verse 5, I want to read verse 4 that's butted up against it. Let me read verses 4 and 5. And there's our word, redeem. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. There's our word. Verse 5 is the word redeem. To redeem those under the law. That word. To, to be held captive. To be held captive by Guilt to be slaves of sin. Slaves. Back in chapter 3, Paul tells us that we were held captive under the law. We were imprisoned. Why? Because the law told us how sinful we are. And you see that word redeemed is one of my favorite words to describe what happens when you become a Christian. You see that word redeem? That word uh, redeem is a word of buying and selling. Redeem is, is um, having a specific amount of money and giving that amount of money and then receiving a real object in return for the money you gave. You redeemed the money. Now, here in this context, Paul has brought us down into the slave market of sin. And in this passage, the death of Jesus on the cross is the price that is paid for slaves to be purchased. That is what the word redemption means. Redemption means the buying of a slave. I want you to think, just bring the drama just look over your shoulder historically. You see it back there. Slavery's back there. There's an American history. Just look back there. It's not that far removed. Look through the fog. Reach back to a word that we've thankfully don't have to use anymore. It's the word manumission. Manumission. You can look it up later. Manumission is when a slave... When a slave owner would set the slaves free as a gesture of goodwill, maybe the master was getting old and part of his will before he died, he wrote in that upon my death, my slaves are set free. Set free to fend for themselves. That is not the language of this passage. Manumission is not the language. Verse 5 is the language of redemption, but not just redemption. Look at verse 5. This is not just redemption. To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. This is not just redemption. This is not manumission, setting free of slaves. This is adoption. This is not just going down to the slave market and, and buying someone out of slavery. This means becoming a son. This reminds us that God the Son, Jesus Christ, is the great emancipator so that God the Father might become the great parent. You see, this is what we celebrate at Advent. That in Christ, you are no longer a slave. Bring the imagery from the 1830s. It's not perfect, but it's enough. Bring it forward. You're no longer a slave living down there in the filthy slave quarter of sin. You've been purchased, and not just purchased, you weren't just set free. You were set free and then brought out of the slave quarters of sin. You've been clothed now in righteousness. You put down those filthy rags. You have the righteousness of Christ over you, and you no longer live in the slave quarters. You've been brought up to the mansion, walked around and said, all of this now is yours because you are a son or a daughter of God in Jesus. In Christ, his virgin birth, his righteous life, his death on the cross, his resurrection, 
at Advent, in Christ, God sets the slaves free. Join me as we pray together. The heads bowed this morning as we go to the Lord. In a time of prayer and commitment, there's some of you that still live in slavery to sin. You've heard the route to freedom. This is what it looks like when you turn away from your sin. That's repentance. And then believe. This is what I'm asking you to do. This is what you prayed about earlier. I'm asking you to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross in the place of sinners. And you as a sinner can be saved by what he's done. Part of our tradition at Hickory Grove is once you hear a sermon, we give you a chance to respond. If you want to talk to somebody about what that means, our pastors will be here. Stand down front, some of our trained leaders, to talk about what it looks like to further your understanding of how to come out of the slavery of sin. God has spoken to your heart. When we sing, we'll invite you to come forward. Father, thank you for the grace you've given us in Jesus. We thank you for the redemption, for purchasing us by the blood of Christ. And by your spirit now, I pray that you would apply that to the hearts of men and women that are stuck in slavery. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand please as we sing together?